today's modern world, is there such a thing as normal family life? Who's to say what's normal? Some families enjoy a dangerous life. Some crave a relaxing life. And some just like the wildlife. In this series, we'll be visiting households across the globe to celebrate the wonderful, the inspirational, and the eccentric. Welcome to the world's most extraordinary families. Coming up, the circus family who settle their disputes with sharp objects. And we meet America's youngest storm chaser and his family on the hunt for a good tornado. This is just amazing. First, we're off to Texas to meet the father and son who risk life and limb for their venomous hobby. I just bought me a leg and kept on doing what I do. This is Rising Star, and this sleepy town in Texas is home to Jackie and Michael Bibby, America's first family of snakes. They call me the Texas Snake Man. I've been involved in rattlesnakes as a hobby and for fun for 49 years, coming up on 50 years. I got started over in Brownwood, Texas when I was 18 years old. I entered the Rattlesnake Sack and Championship. That's a timed event where two people have to get in a pit with 10 rattlesnakes and put them in a bag as quickly as possible. And you get a five second penalty if you get bit. We do get bit a lot during that contest. And I won two trophies, $30, and got my name in the paper. I currently hold the world record for that sport and have over 100 trophies. The rest, as they say, is history because I was hooked. Jackie is a veteran snake handler with over 30 years' experience. And as well as touring the country putting on rattlesnake shows, the family run a snake rescue service. They buy and sell snakes for their skin and train household pets to stay away from the venomous rattler. My oldest son became interested in it at an early age. He started handling a lot with me at the shows I did when he was about 15 years old. I was born into this. Uh, my dad's done it my entire life, so I started doing it real young, and, and I enjoy doing it. I enjoy what we do. I enjoy the traveling. I enjoy meeting all the people we get to meet, um, and it's a lot of fun, a lot of adrenaline when you're handling a dangerous uh, reptile like a rattlesnake that has the capacity to, to, uh, to kill you if you're not careful. It's an amazing feeling. The adrenaline is like no drug in the world. It's, it's feels good. And there's not many people that can do what we do. I learned from the best. Handling venomous rattlesnakes with your mouth is not for the faint-hearted and has earned Jackie celebrity status as the Snake Man. Most famous person in Rise to Star Texas. That just kind of became my nickname a long time ago. I've used it as amazing vehicles. Got me all over the world and opened a lot of doors for me and given me the opportunity to travel and meet a lot of people. And Make a little bit of money and have a whole hell of a lot of fun. The family run a dedicated snake museum in the town, where the familiar sound of the rattlesnake's tail can be heard, warning off any potential threats. This is one of our medium-sized ones. This is something like uh, you'd use for snakes in the mouth. I'll be great for putting snakes in my mouth. That looks like a good one. It's got a good, clean rattler. There's multiple different facets of what we do involved with these reptiles. You know, I'm almost 70 years old. I'm pretty spry for an old crippled man, but still the fact remains I can't do what I used to when I was 30. So Michael's gonna have to move up and begin to help in some areas where it kind of takes a little of the pressure off of me. Watch that thing, kind of jicky. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. I wanted to make him proud. I wanted to do uh, the things that he did. And now that I'm getting closer to actually running the business. I want to just make him proud. I mean, I want to do a good job. Why don't you check the mouth on one of them? The daredevil stunts and killing of snakes has been criticized by some animal rights campaigners, and Jackie and Michael are ready to move with the times. I'm in hopes that Michael will be able to refine this business into something that maybe will be more timely, because I think he's going to have to go more educational and more uh, scientific if he's going to be able to hold the interest of the people who will be wanting to come to shows and listen to what he has to say. So I'm hoping he can develop it in that way so as to keep it current. 
the world we live in today is just changing. So just like anything else, you can't do the same thing forever. We think we can take it a lot farther than just performing the daredevil stunts like we've always done. Good mouth, good thing. Yeah. He just shot all his venom out at me. Did he squirt it all out? Yeah. Squirted it all over. Yeah. And that's good size too, so. Hopefully we'll have some more of them for too long. Certainly it's rewarding to have Michael elect to go into this hobby alongside me and to learn from me and to take this thing maybe to a different level than I ever did, maybe in a little bit different way. It's overwhelming a little bit, but it's also exciting. Actually taking the reins and, and direction is, is a big step, but I'm excited for it. Next, the family get a call to rescue an unwanted house guest. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You got something? I got something. Look out, Dad, look out. But now it's time to meet a father-daughter team with an equally dangerous profession. Meet the Travis family, daughter Eve and dad Neil, better known as Yvelle and Baldini, who quit their day jobs and now pay the bills by dicing with death, performing in a dangerous sideshow act up and down the UK. The family are trained professionals, so please do not attempt any of the stunts you are about to see. The family circus tradition began when Dad Neil ran out of money whilst backpacking around Europe and learnt some circus tricks to earn some extra cash. So glamorous, the life of the performer. When he came home, he decided to learn as much as humanly possible. Um, and tried his hand at lots of different things. And then when he met my mum, they decided, you know, they'd do that together. And there was Uncle Percy, who did a street show with my dad. And there was this big group of weirdos, basically, that all did circus stuff together. And they performed uh, locally at a lot of carnivals and, and things like that, but also further afield. Now, with Eve taking over the reins, the dangerous duo have performed at festivals and shows up and down the country. Today, they are preparing in the back garden for their next gig in a few weeks' time. I think at first, our neighbours thought we were completely mad. Every now and again, you just get people kind of going... as they walk past. Eve quit her law degree and convinced her former circus star dad to come out of retirement to risk life and limb on stage once again. I thought, I'm a bit old for this, there's a reason why I retired. But I wanted to encourage Eve in what she's doing and always have, if she, if she wanted to do anything, I'd be as supportive as I could. Most parents would be, like, absolutely outraged after I'd uh, dropped out of university to become a circus performer. They were really cool about it, which was really nice. I actually would have preferred her to work in an office, but it's her life. I'm actually the boss in terms of our working relationship. I, um, I plan everything, pick the costumes, uh, with obviously with help. Um, I don't have the final say, um, but a lot of the work that we get comes from me getting it. It's really nice. It'll be good with big hair, not mm. hair. My mum is certainly a force to be reckoned with. She is the only thing that me and my dad are scared of. Um, which sounds crazy when we're dealing with, like, chainsaws and fire. Eve and I wanted to, to create something where the roles were reversed, so he was the glamorous assistant and not her. A lot of acts like ours traditionally would have a, a male star as such and then a glamorous assistant, but I speak on stage um, and we both equally share the skill. Eve has the mic and does all the talking, and I'm the idiot. Uh, we like to mix comedy with danger or grossness, so it, it has like a, a bit of an emotional roller coaster. So one moment's gross, the next moment's scary, the next moment's technically different, the next moment's silly, and I provide the silly. My dad is a huge kid. He's very much like, like how can we make this worse? How can we make this more dangerous? What can we add? So. You know, you're on the ladder of swords, you're juggling knives, your head's on fire, there's laser guided sharks. You know, anything he could think of, it's like more and more and more and more. I really don't like you doing that. I'm just like, oh, no. Well, we don't, once you learn how to do that, you don't practice it, because every time you practice it, you, you, there is a risk of actually cutting. It's funny what 
freaks me out and what doesn't, because most things don't, but there are just certain things that either one of us do. Like, he really doesn't like the body piercing, um, which is called, like, human pincushion. It's horrible. What, it's just like, no, I know, I wish that hurts. Don't do it, baby girl. <laughs> It's the same skill. It's such a show-off. <laughs> <laughs> Once the leading lady in this family double act, now Mum Deborah makes the amazing costumes worn on stage and today she is preparing the outfits for their up-and-coming show. It's nice for the three of us. You get to be very creative. To have ideas for costumes and for performances and to, to just be really creative and and uh, bounce off each other with that's quite nice. You know, there are arguments sometimes, but, um, but even I usually win those because we know what's best. <laughs> I think at the, at the moment there's a, a beauti with beautiful, beautiful vintage uh, waistcoat that I've got, to, I've got to fix because someone did a chainsaw act and um, got a little bit too close to her father. It's my waistcoat. It, not that, that makes it better, but it's you know it's just mm. a little little nick. But um, yeah, we get little. Finish. Yeah, a little nick that big with a chainsaw. But it didn't go through to his back, so we're okay. But that needs fixing as well. Coming up in preparation for their impending performance, Dad has a new dangerous trick in mind. First of all, tip it onto a spoon and heat the molten lead and spit it out to water, and the water boils. And next, we meet a father-son team who love to spend their weekends together, chasing tornadoes. When he's not in school, nine-year-old Chase from Florence, Texas, is one of America's youngest storm chasers. Storm chasing is, it's, it could be scary at some moments, some moments could be fun, and it's just very exciting and it's thrilling. Now, every good storm chaser needs a reliable wingman. And for Chase, that's stepdad Jason. I've had an interest in storms most of my life. There's so much I love about it. And once I got my first shot of lightning, I just ran with it from there. Jason has turned his love of storms and photography into a full-time job. I host the most adventurous photography workshops on Earth. If you have any interest in the weather or nature or adventure, I mean, this is definitely the thing for you. There's nothing else like it. You're never going to forget it. It's definitely addictive. As well as taking out amateur storm chasers, each trip is an opportunity for Jason to build up his already impressive portfolio. Photography workshops are my big thing. And then, you know, all sorts of sales. People buy prints. Sometimes companies use them for advertising. I do a lot of time-lapse photography and videos. That'll sell to the media. And Jason has had plenty of opportunities as the United States is hit with around a 1,000 tornadoes every year with the peak of the season in spring. Following in his stepdad's footsteps, it wasn't long before aptly named Chase went on his first adventure. When we first started taking Chase out, he was four years old, and he would just take his mom's cell phone and aim it out the window, you know, because we was, it was stay in the car, Chase, because you know, he was a little guy, and we were overprotective. I'm looking at the radar, and the storm's coming this way. My favorite story I have was probably the first tornado I ever saw was in Florida, West Palm Beach. We were driving and we saw a water spout and that was probably my favorite moment because it was the first like tornado or water spout I ever saw, which was really cool for me because I've never I had never seen one. Some of the things he's got to see, he's you know, been on a storm that's produced a dozen tornadoes and he's seen you know, beautiful lightning. I definitely think he enjoys it. Whilst his friends might spend their weekends playing video games, Chase rarely misses an opportunity to go out with the family. Any chance he can get and he's free, he's got a busy schedule for a little guy. He has to go to school, he has football practice, you know, a lot of responsibilities. Um, yeah, any chance he gets, he likes to come out. 
Most of my friends know about storm chasing because my stepdad came in my classroom and did a big presentation about storm chasing. They said it was pretty cool. Some of them might think it's too dangerous for me because I'm just a kid. Today, the family are preparing for another expedition, and the first thing to do is check the weather. We've got big storms moving in off the coastline. Could I come look at it? Yeah, absolutely. Let's start to look at it. These are all big storms out here over the water, so as the day goes on, these will push inland. Just about a county and a half to the east. We go all over. We end up up into Wyoming, Dakotas, and Nebraska, and Iowa, and Illinois, pretty far north. Um, sometimes it's really nothing to go, you know, 1,000, 2,000 miles in a day for a storm chase. Most of the time when you're storm chasing, it can't always just be a night. Sometimes it can be three weeks. It could be a month. It just depends. It can be fun, but sometimes it's aggravating because you're stuck in the car so long. Looks like we'll have some storms in a few hours. We should probably get moving. You ready to go? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Once you get your tripod, make sure you got your camera. Coming up, this father-son team brave the weather and head out on their next dangerous adventure. But next, it's time for snake handlers Michael and Jackie Bibby to face off against a venomous foe. Snake wranglers Jackie and Michael Bibby have received a call from friend Scott, who thinks he's got an unwelcome guest in his barn. Naturally, a snake is a scary animal, so when people see them and they don't know what to do, they call on us. We go out and uh, get that snake off their property so as to make sure it's safe for their kids, grandkids, for themselves, for their livestock, their dogs, their pets. Texas is home to 10 different species of rattlesnake. The western diamondback is the most common and widespread venomous snake in the state and can grow to around seven feet long. Oh my goodness, maybe that's the one he was talking about. Now we're talking. That's no baby, that's a real deal right there. Yeah, that's snake hunting up there, guys. Yeah. Ooh. Once the snake has been captured, they bring it back to base where it will become part of Jackie's show. Way to go. Gotten uh, anywhere from one or two rattlesnakes to 40 rattlesnakes out from under people's houses. So uh, that's, you just never know what you're getting into. After a successful rattler rescue, the father-son team return to their museum and are keen to show off their most prized exhibit. We have a beautiful white rattlesnake. His name is Diablo Blanco, which is Spanish for white devil. Come on, Diablo Blanco, you gotta get out here and be on camera. We gotta show people how pretty you are. He's not albino. Albino is an absence of pigment, means you have none. He has pigment, it's just white. A white snake like that wouldn't survive in the wild. Uh, one of a rattlesnake's most important defense mechanisms is the, their camouflage. They're very hard to see in their natural environment. That white rattlesnake would not live very long. He's a very unusual snake, worth a lot of money. You can tell by looking at his rattlers, his rattlers have never been broken. Many of the snakes we catch in the wild will have broken rattlers because the rattlers are very brittle and they oftentimes break off. But Diablo Blanco has about 20 rattlers and they're a perfect set, so they're very beautiful. You see that right there, all those rattlers. Started with the first button that he had when he was born. Very, very pretty snake, very big, very heavy. He eats like no snake we've ever seen. This snake does have his fangs. He does has his venom. He has the capacity to inflict a deadly bite. So he's very, very dangerous. So we're extremely careful when we're handling these snakes. Diablo Blanco. Next, the Bibby family head out to the desert on a wild snake hunt. Always got snakes out here. But back in the UK, the Travis family are making their last minute preparations for their big show. In 
In just two weeks, this father and daughter circus act will take to the stage, so the duo are busy practicing their death-defying stunts. I'm so sorry. Oh, my God. And for this family, practice can be painful. When I first bought that whip, uh, I couldn't even make it make the sound. I didn't really know how that worked, so you'd, you're sort of just waving this ridiculously dangerous thing around. And I caught myself so many times, and I had, like, welts and, like, little cuts and scratches, and it's really, really, really painful. You wouldn't want to volunteer for it every day, unless you're bald and crazy. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. You know, and I think sometimes people watch Neil and Eve and think, oh, I could do that, and you don't see the hours and hours of practice and preparation. The rehearsals for the show have three different stages. You learn the techniques first, and that's about getting the technique right. So I want to practice until I can't get it wrong. Not practice until I can do it, but practice until I can't not do it. Then we'll rehearse what movement is around that and what language, what, what words we use around it. And then we rehearse the comedy. You comfortable? The way to make it safe is rehearse it until it doesn't go wrong. When things go wrong, it, it can be really quite disconcerting, uh, especially on stage. And, you know, there's that, like, age-old phrase of the show must go on, and the show must go on, we have to carry on going, we, we continue regardless. That's <laughs> 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 Maybe backwards is too soon, Baldy. You can be the most practised, the most perfect, and eventually something might go wrong, that you, whether it's your own fault or, like, extenuating circumstances. Whenever you're doing anything at all, any activity, every so often things go wrong, and we accept injury as, as part of it. We've had a couple of incidents. I broke my dad's rib. That was fun. And then we had to go home and tell my mum, which was less fun. Hopefully there will be no more broken bones here as the family head to the local park to try out some of their bigger stunts. Sometimes they want to do things that I think are too dangerous and so I might argue with them about it. I can also get quite carried away and think it's a really good idea, but then I might sleep on it and say no. I have mad ideas because I think when you're coming up with a concept, if you want to aim here, you chuck in all the ideas, even the ones that are as crazy as this. I tend to have the maddest ideas because I, I, I like challenging myself. I think, oh, I want to learn this. They were talking about eating molten lead at one point, but then I thought about it and decided perhaps not. Ready? This is a very old sideshow act where you have a crucible, you melt lead into it, and on stage you add more lead to it, and then you take a, a pot of the crucible, tip it onto a spoon, and eat the molten lead and spit it out to water, and the water boils. Um, now, we're more aware nowadays of things like lead poisoning and stuff like that, and how it can be absorbed through the skin. So we've looked at it, and Debbie's gone, nope, it's not happening. We still have the equipment, just in case. <laughs> Thankfully, knives and molten lead are banned from this park, so the couple have to settle for something a little safer. I've only very recently learned to juggle, so I'm the world's most rubbish juggler. I don't worry a great deal. I think you, you get injured. They've both cut their feet on the glass. Eve quite badly. I insist that they carry super glue. Other glues are available um, with them all the time just to use it because you can't go and get your feet stitched. Um, but it just happens and that's life. But if you practice and you get good at what you do, then you're less likely to get injured. <laughs> My mum has a power of veto with the acts that we do. Um, mostly, we decide all together anyway. 
But if my dad or I don't want to do something, there's a bit more of a discussion. If my mum says, absolutely no way, then it's absolutely no way. Uh, she has to put up with a lot, and I think that's fair that she gets that choice. Coming up, the day of the performance is finally here. But will the audience love their show? And will they survive it unscathed? And next, America's youngest storm chaser hits the road in the hope of finding his biggest twister yet. In Austin, Texas, Jason Weingart and nine-year-old stepson Chase are hitting the road for their favorite hobby. Here is my camera. Here, take one of the walkie-talkies. A weekend chasing storms around the southern United States. The family's plan is to head off towards the coast where they hope that the sea breeze will be pulling in an afternoon thunderstorm. The cloud you're seeing there, that's what this big green blob is. Now, most trips out for professional storm photographer Jason consist of teaching amateurs how to capture that perfect image. However, this trip is an opportunity for Jason and Chase to try and get their own iconic shot. When everything works out perfect and you're standing there and your storm's blowing up and now there's a tornado on the ground, I mean, that's, that's the best part. I think I'm very lucky because not a lot of people get to go out and storm chase. My favorite picture I've taken, we were driving and there was this funnel with a rainbow over it. It was a big, it was kind of like a tornado and there was a rainbow over it, so I thought that was a really cool picture. Some of the things I do with my pictures is sometimes my parents will go to art shows, they'll take a couple of my pictures. Sometimes people will buy them, sometimes they don't. I'm feeling excited. I hope that it's going to be a good storm, but you never can be sure. It can be very dangerous, but it depends on the circumstances. You could be far away and there could just be a small tornado. That would be kind of safe if you're far away. You just have to be careful for traffic and stuff. It's getting stronger, so that's a good sign. Yeah, this one has a good potential. Now, the weather seems clear at the moment, but it can be unpredictable, and it has put the family in some dangerous situations in the past. When you're not planning ahead for the unexpected, that's when you're going to get yourself in a bad spot, and that's where it can become dangerous. You don't want to have your main road going out of, you know, of a storm into safety, being a road that's just been sitting there getting rained on is going to be completely, you know, mud and impassable, and then you're in trouble when you're trying to get out of there. So you want to make sure you have a nice, clean way to just get right out of there and have yourself safe within a matter of minutes. This is a bad situation here. We have a large tornado coming behind us. And everybody's stuck on this road right now. The closest call we had, it was actually my second tornado. It was in El Reno, Oklahoma on May 31st, 2013. And it was the largest tornado in US history. It actually killed several people, including some well-known tornado researchers. Um, there was a lot of traffic on the roads, which made it a lot more dangerous that day. It was just west of Oklahoma City metro area. They told people to evacuate, which kind of you know, made a bad situation even worse. And then we had another tornado drop down to our west while we were stuck in traffic. So going back to those escape routes, that's kind of something we took from that day. There's really no secret or mystery to storm chasing. It's just you know, developing kind of that instinct by getting out and chasing as much as you can. Now it's gonna start picking up. Did you hear the thunder? Did you hear it? Everything amazes me. Next, as the weather begins to turn, has the family found their first storm of the day? But first, the Bibby family are out on a hunt for wild and venomous rattlesnakes. Jackie Bibby knows more than most that rattlesnakes carry a venomous bite that can be lethal. They can still bite even after having their heads cut off. Certainly there's always a danger of being bitten when you're handling a venomous reptile. And in the time that I've been handling 49 years, I've received 12 serious bites. Now a serious bite means that you have to require hospitalization. About four out of 10 rattlesnake bites are what's known as a dry bite. You receive a puncture wound, but no envenomation. 
Now, I've had numerous ones of those, but if they don't require hospitalization, I really don't keep up with them. But 12 bites, which the worst ones when I lost my leg, that was about six or seven years ago I was doing a show in Dallas, Texas. Rattlesnake bit above my boot, envenomated so much that by the time they got to the hospital, it had killed my leg, and so they had to amputate my leg. They started out below the knee, but 10 operations later, wound up above the knee, they finally got it to good flesh, and then I just bought me a leg and kept on doing what I do. Rattlesnake venom is hemotoxic. So you're dealing with a venom that's hemotoxic, it attacks the blood, but it's also a muscle deterrent that aids the snake in his digestion. So anytime an animal or ourselves or anybody gets envenomated by a rattlesnake, that begins to break down tissue almost immediately. That's why you see the damage that has occurred related to the rattlesnake bites that I've got, because it deteriorates the tissue to the point that it can't come back. That's why I lost my leg. Many snakes have a neurotoxic venom that attacks the autonomic nervous system, but the rattlesnake has a hemotoxic venom, attacks the blood. And you can see the deterioration on my other thumb. That's from having bitten on that thumb and the pad deteriorated, just wilted away and there wasn't one any way for it to recover. It's a miracle he's lived through as many bites as he had. One of the funniest things when he tells people he's been bit 12 times, he only counts the ones that he went to the hospital. <laughs> so he's been bit quite a few times. And it's always scary when somebody gets bit, but that's part of what we do. I'm very excited about the fact that Michael, having been handled for 12 years, has never received a bite, not even a scratch. Nope. And I'd certainly like to think that's partially related to the fact that I've always wrote him pretty heavily about the safety issue, and he hadn't pressed the envelope in some of the same ways that I have. I'm hyper aware. When I'm in a pit full of rattlesnakes, I always know what's going on, what snake is where, what snake to watch for. Uh, that's just how I was trained. Um, Any time that a snake handler gets careless, even for a minute, you're going to get bit. I think he can have a long, illustrious career of handling snakes and never have to receive an envenomation. So I'm really proud of the fact that he's very careful and he's an excellent snake handler. The Bibbies are off to the desert on a wild snake hunt. The duo have a show coming up at Redneck Woodstock in Rising Star, and to perform the rattlesnake shows, they need a lot of snakes and they also sell them for their skins. A lot of people make products out of tanned rattlesnake skin. They make hat bands, uh, bill folds, belts, uh, purses, uh, wristbands, decorative things. And also a lot of people like to eat rattlesnake meat. It's considered a delicacy. First, they stop off for a bite to eat. Friend Scott, who the family saved from a deadly encounter in his barn earlier, has offered to do the driving but is a little nervous about being bitten. You don't want no rattlesnake bite. How many times have you been bit? Twelve so far. How many times have you been married? Ten. Which one's worse? Women. <laughs> 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 They're more dangerous. <laughs> Take issue with that logic. <laughs> <laughs> Wild rattlesnake hunting is strictly controlled and also really dangerous. Luckily, Jackie and his son have all the necessary permits and expertise they need to stay safe. I think any individual who might be in an area where they could encounter a wild rattlesnake, they should know and understand what to do. Because a lot of people are gonna jump and run and that's probably the most dangerous thing they can do because they might run over a rattlesnake they don't see, step on it, and it would cause them to, uh, to be bitten by the rattlesnake. The most important thing to do if you encounter a rattlesnake in the wild is to be very still. Look around and find a clear avenue of escape because the snakes are very difficult to see. They're almost invisible in their natural environment. So look around and then walk away slowly and cautiously. In most cases, you'll never receive a bite. And this gravel pit, this point right here and then that point right over yonder, always got snakes out here, every time. Uh, am I proud of my dad? Absolutely. He's done something with rattlesnakes that nobody else has ever done to the degree he's done it. All right, I got one. I'm very happy that he's gotten to live out some of his dreams, traveling the world and, and being famous and things like that. Uh, so I'm absolutely proud of him. It's about a two-year-old. I'd like to see Michael attain the success I've attained, maybe even more. I have great uh, confidence in the fact that he's going to do really well. 
So I'm very excited about him taking over and, and just going on with this thing and, and having a lot of fun and making a little bit of money like what I did. We're definitely living our dreams out. We we have a really good life today. You know, we uh, go a lot of places, see a lot of people, have a lot of fun. We just have a blast. In Texas, Jason Weingart is on the hunt for weather. And along for the hopefully wild ride is his nine-year-old stepson and storm hunting partner, Chase. God, I can barely see anything. Not quite the storm they were hoping for, but the family are thrilled to run into a thick cloud of mist. Why? It's not always about getting a really close lightning strike or seeing a big tornado. Sometimes it's cool just to see something you've never seen before. This is just amazing. Look at that, man. It's awesome. I gotta get another picture. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. I've seen hail. The size of it has been about quarters, probably held up the biggest I've ever seen it. I've seen uh, lightning. I've seen tornadoes. I've seen really big thunderstorms. I've seen funnels, water spouts, and I've seen a lot of things. My favorite thing to take pictures of is probably lightning because of just how it looks and it's just really cool looking because all the color of it and everything about it is just cool and amazing. For professional photographer Jason, as well as spending some quality time with Chase, his time on the road represents that quest for the perfect shot. I like to try to tell a story with my pictures, if at all possible. If there's something that I can put into that, any kind of figure that's dealing with the weather, you know, that's when you get an exceptional shot. It's hard to pick a favorite kind of weather to photograph. They're all different. They're all unique in their own way. It's just a moment in time that you're trying to capture. But, you know, I love chasing tornadoes, just the adrenaline that comes along with that. But from a photography standpoint, for the better photos, it might be lightning you know, because it's a really beautiful, bright thing that happens and it's gone in a flash forever. So if you got that picture, you, know, you were able to preserve that moment. I'm always looking to have, you know, the best picture of that event that I could possibly get. It's never like just, you know, a storm or just shooting up at the sky. It's always trying to find a good scene. As far as a quintessential shot, I'm still out looking for it. There's always this, like, one or two shots in my head that I'm just probably never going to get, but I'm going to keep searching for them. And then everything I get in between, it's just kind of okay. Unfortunately, today the weather isn't playing ball, but as Jason and Chase know, a good day out doesn't rely on seeing a twister. Oh, look, there's a rainbow. Oh, wow, yeah. It's really fun just being able to come out and take pictures of the storms and just whatever you get to see. I'm really glad I get to do it. Storm chasing definitely gives us some time to just get away from all the stress and come out and just hang out and get to know each other a little better and spend some good time and we do a little bonding and, you know, and get to see awesome stuff like even just rainbows. But he can appreciate this as well too. It's been awesome seeing him grow up into a very impressive and respectful young man. This picture looks pretty good. Yeah, that was cool. I didn't like storms at all because I just, I didn't really like them and I didn't like getting on the wet from the rain, and, but now I do. Let's go. The big day is here, and it's time for the Travis family to head off to their performance at a local tattoo convention. Today we're gonna do a a half hour show at a local gig at King's Hall. The act will be bed of nails, ladder of swords, walking on broken glass. I think he's going to eat a light bulb. Um, We're doing fire as well. Fire, not nails up a, up a nose. It's not quite like when you do a cabaret show, people buy a ticket and they come to see you. But because um, there's so many artists there where there's lots of entertainment, it's almost like you have to capture the audience a little bit more. If you weren't nervous, you wouldn't care. 
It'd be very strange not to feel nervous. The adrenaline you get from a little bit of nerves makes a bit of nails less uncomfortable, or the lads are less uncomfortable. <laughs> when we get there, we still have to look at the stage, see how big the stage is, assess everything. So some of the things we've got planned, we might discard. Uh, we always have to be flexible, don't we? Makeup and costume are absolutely necessary to like create the whole image. It shows someone instantly before the show even starts sort of what to expect. Um, so you, it's very important not to get that wrong. You kind of hide behind it. Like it literally is a mask and you're this persona and you're not yourself. Hello. My job is to mess things up. <laughs> Your makeup box is really empty, and I was com confused, and then I realised that's probably because I've just stolen all of your makeup. We have like a good laugh backstage and stuff, and that's great. But to be honest, like we probably bond the most on like the long drives because we have so many long journeys, and um, so to keep this one like alert, we we chat like the entire way. When you've talked to each other for like six hours solid, like that's probably more than most dads and daughters talk to, you know, each other in like a few days. Today I'm just here because I'm the general gopher, so I have to go and get the drinks and she's going to eat some glass, so I had to go and get a cake because you need to eat before you eat glass. <laughs> You need to have something carby in your stomach, really, um, so that it can find its way out. <laughs> so, glass eating to start. Then I'm thinking knife swords, and then I like doing the bed of nails after that. Whip to finish. Hold on, finished. After their transformation, the pair become Yvelle and Baldini, Britain's number one father-daughter danger sideshow act. And after a few last-minute nerves, it's time for the big performance. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Staffordshire Tattoo Gallery. I take quite a lot of pride because it's great to see them working together and, and getting on so well and being creative together and actually enjoying their life. We'd be financially a lot better off if, um, if we all had normal jobs, but I don't think we'd be quite as happy. Don't make him do it. Ah! When we have a really good show, there's no other feeling like that even better because it was you and your dad. I love um, every day that we have together, the work that we do, the life that I lead. Even when it's really difficult, even when it's stressful, I'm gonna have a better day than most people do because I've got my mum and dad there with me. Thank you and good night. It's been a good show and a good day. We always want to improve the show, so we want to fine-tune what we're already doing. Also, we think like, uh, it'd be really nice to get my mum involved in some more stuff. It'd be cool to get her up on stage maybe a bit more, or see how she feels about that, I don't know. I think she's quite keen. I worry about my wife. She's more fragile than Eve. Eve's a very tomboy, sort of strong girl. You're going to get in so much trouble for calling mum fragile, and in so much trouble for saying I am not. <laughs> 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 